Okay, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the June 15th City Council Workshop and Business Meeting. Uh, this session will be conducted remotely and council members will only participate electronically. For those viewing online, please ensure that you join this meeting using the following website, www.lewistonmaine.gov slash 2021cc. If by chance you joined using any other link, we encourage you to log off and re-log on using that website. Uh, public comment on any item appearing on the agenda may be sent to public comment at lewistonmaine.gov prior to or during the meeting and all comments will be forwarded to the Lewiston City Council. Uh, with that, we're gonna move to our 6 p.m. workshop and we do know that Councillor Pettengill is attempting to get logged in and he should be here shortly, but if staff in five minutes or so, if he's not here, if staff could just double check uh, so with that, we'll move to item A, which is a discussion regarding murals and signs uh, in reference to a possibly new policy. And I'll turn that over to our city administrator to, to uh, introduce it. Well, good evening, uh, Mayor, City Councilors. Uh, while well, Dale brings in uh, Director Hedegar, um, Planning and Code uh, has been uh, working on a uh, policy regarding mural uh, installations throughout the city for both public and private uh, properties. And um, they have uh, a presentation this evening to run through uh, some recommendations around that. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn it right over to uh, Director Hedegar at this point. Great, thanks Dennis. Um, yeah, so as Dennis mentioned, um, there's been a lot of interest about con um, murals in the community. And we had a couple of requests recently and one of them involved um, potentially having some advertising or sponsorship on it. And that triggered some larger discussions about what actually is a mural, what is a sign. And we don't really make that distinction in our ordinance. Um, so what you folks have here in front of you is some draft language to um, make a distinction as to exactly what is a mural uh, and what is a sign and potentially some policy to try to drive um, how we make that decision as to, as to what's involved with that. Um, so, I think we've made it known that, um, you know, clearly we support the arts and we want to see these types of activities occur in, in the community. Um, and there is a distinction to be made between public art and private art and how these things occur. Um, public art obviously is anything that's on city owned property, private art is on private property. What we want to do is try to come up with a system where we can advise people early on in the process so they don't make a decision that necessarily is contrary to either state law or local law as to what is a mural and sign. Um, so what you have in front of you here is um, basically the, the meat of this starts on page two as far as what the process would be if someone was looking to do a mural. Um, they would basically contact our, our, our department and determine what the status of that property is in that building. Is it a public building, a private building? Is it historic? All of those things will have different um, outcomes, right? If it's public, there should be a process involved in that. If it's private, we're looking to actually have as much of a hands-off process involvement on that as possible. And then if historic, that's potentially gonna involve the local historic preservation review board as well as the state. At that point, we would explain all the rules to the applicant and advise them accordingly. So if it's private property, great. We would come up with some type of permit approval process where basically you would demonstrate that you have the permission of the owner. And then we would essentially sign off on that process point. Um, if it's on public property, various departments will probably be involved, public works, planning code enforcement, the council, and I reference uh, possibly the arts committee. I'll, I'll touch base on that in a, in a moment. And then historic preservation, again, if necessary, if it's on a historic building. Um, we would come up with a simple application. We're not look, look, looking to collect a fee. Basically, this is meant to be advisory in nature so we can give someone a heads up as to whether or not they're gonna be running into any issues as, um, again, as to if this is a sign or a mural. Um, if it's on uh, public property or historic structures, then there's things that probably need to be considered. And I think you're gonna hear a little bit more about this um, in the next workshop I, uh, item from Heidi, um, as far as different processes or what may need to be taken into consideration when public art is considered. But for example, you folks might be looking at what's necessary for wall maintenance agreements, 
Do we want an image of, of the picture? You know, what's going to be painted on a city wall? Um, a rendering of it. Um, and again, you guys will probably be weighing into this. A big factor is into this is content. Um, are we regulating content? I can tell you this office does not want to regulate content. Um, there's a ton of case law out there about regulating the content of, of signs and in images. Um, what we're trying to do here is make sure that um, we are being consistent with state law as to when is a sign a sign and when is it advertising. Uh, you'll hear people reference Maine's billboard law. Um, that's a specific section of Title 23, and there's a reason you don't see billboards in the state of Maine. Basically, they're prohibited. You can't have off-premise advertising. So we've had some discussions with um, people interested in doing murals as far as being able to have some type of signage possibly on a mural. And, and quite frankly, is that signage? Um, listing of a sponsor, large mural, and you want the ability to put um, names of businesses or individuals who donated to the cause or, or uh, you know, wanted to be recognized as a financial contributor of some sort. At what point does that become advertising? At what point does that become a sign? So we've attempted to address that um, within our um, text amendments. So on page three, you'll see a number of um, changes made to the zoning and land use code. Um, where we come up with a definition of mural. Um, and again, where we're trying to not get into the regulation of content, we've added language in here um, where the image is neither used or nor is the nature of advertisement, must not contain trademarks, logos, or other identifying symbols or words associated with business or messaging or imagery that promotes self-injury, suicide, ter terrorism, harassment, domestic violence, hate speech, or contains sexually explicit or obscene material. Um, there's actually some case law out there that's very specific to what is obscene material. Hopefully we'll never get there and, and have to deal with that. But again, if it's on private property, we just kind of want to make sure that, you know, hey, do you meet this definition? Are you going to be doing any of these things and if so great you're either going to be a sign or oh geez no you are proposing something offensive you probably don't want to do that we don't want to see you spend a lot of time and resources only for the city to ask you to remove something later on um, with respect to the sponsorship we've added some language in here that talks about not containing more than one percent of the area devoted to the names and or logos of, or, of organizations or businesses that may have sponsored or installed the mural is otherwise being regulated. Um, that 1% has been discussed um, with a number of folks, including staff in this department as to what should that percentage be? Um, we've chosen 1% because we feel as though that if you're truly not looking to advertise, um, but you want some recognition, 1% of a painted mural seems reasonable. Um, not knowing what size the mural is going to be, right? Uh, the mural on the side of a building could be 10 by 10, or it could be, you know, 40 by 40. One percent of that is 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 significant, um, in the sense that these murals are really meant to um, provide uh, another, um, you know, attraction to the community, improvement to the streetscape, possibly select, um, celebrate some culture or art in a, in the neighborhood. It's not necessarily supposed to be seen as advertising. And I don't think that people would take it as advertising, but again, we wanna have some type of limitation on it so we don't run into that um, conflict with state law. We've also made some changes to this existing definition of sign. So it is now um, consistent with state law. Um, we had some discrepancies there. I think what we do have here now before you is consistent with state law. So. I think we'll be in better shape there. Um, if we don't do anything, I would suggest at a minimum, we, we make some tweaks to that just to be consistent. And I guess with try to wrap that up and so we can have a, a conversation, some steps that we think would be necessary next is have the city attorney look at the text amendments just for consistency of state law, specifically that aspect with respect to off-premise advertising and the 1%, make sure that we're not setting ourselves up or property owners for challenge. Um, I'm not, the goal here is not to have anybody fail, um, but try to provide some flexibility with respect to this advertising or sponsorship on a, a mural where it isn't deemed advertising. 
um, upon getting a recommendation from the city attorney, we would come back to you folks in the planning board with some language changes. Um, we would come up with a uh, mural application, something again, very simple, no fee, just basically a checklist. Are you doing these types of things? And then the fourth item I had here was uh, recommend that the council determine whether an arts committee should be established. So um, what I failed to remember was that um, back in December, 2019, the council actually created a public arts committee. Um, what's occurring right now, and you'll learn more about this in the second presentation is that there's a working group right now there that, that is acting as the public arts committee. But one of their tasks actually as adopted by the council back in December was to provide specific recommendations on murals on public property. So knowing that already is in place and that committee is actually gonna be you know, more structured and formalized in the future, I think that's a good um, tool and, and, and resource for you folks to make a determination as to, or a resource for the board to get some guidance as to what is a mural and is it gonna be appropriate on public property. Honestly, I don't feel like I did a great job of explaining what we're trying to do right here. <laughs> so I'm gonna turn it over to you guys and you can maybe ask me some questions that'll answer. I, I thought that was a good overview. So I, we appreciate that. Uh, questions or comments from the council? I have a couple until I see some hands raised. Uh, so the art committee, when it would, I think it would be important for the council to hear from them before we decide on, on these issues. Is that a possibility, Dave? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, the information you have before you folks tonight too has been um, provided to the art committee um, as well as the downtown uh, Lisbon Street Association um, because there's a lot of interest in doing these murals in the immediate downtown area. So to get some feedback from them, I think would be good. Um, at the same time, I do think there's some value in moving forward with the amendments, if just to provide some clarification. So if somebody does come in and wants to put up a, a mural with clearly there's advertising on it, right? Um, if we have a definition that says, hey, as long as you don't do these things, you are a mural. Um, then we're good. Honestly, this has never been an issue. We have a handful, a full handful of murals on um, public and private property already in the, in the community um, that we've had little to no discussion about. So I think I don't know that this is necessarily a problem, but as it becomes a more attractive, um, as it becomes a, another uh, amenity that we're looking to provide in the community, I think some guidance is necessary, especially when we run into situations with historic structures and whatnot. How are we going to approach those? And then uh, the only other organization I would suggest that maybe we reach out to, and I, and I apologize, I can't remember the name, but I know Melanie Terrian is part of that group of artists. Uh, so maybe another council will be able to, to to remember that name. But I think if we reach out to her, she can share it. I think Graylin uh, is part of that. There's a whole group that, so it, I think it would be important to reach out to them as well. And then my final question is about advertisements. So if, if uh, I should say about sponsorship. So if it's truly a sponsorship, a, a business is stepping up to pay for a, a mural uh, to provide public art, and they, you know, they are able to put their business or logo in tucked away in the corner, but there's no advertising of times the businesses are open, what they offer for services or anything like that. It's truly just sponsored by any business. Uh, isn't there, is, I, I struggle to see how that would be considered an advertisement unless it's very clear in the law that just having a business name would create an advertisement. But if they're not advertising services or time of operation and stuff, that's where I really struggle with that. Can you, can you just share your thoughts on that, Dave? Yeah, sure. So um, in an extreme case, if you had a building and all you wanted to do was put the golden arches on it, um, that absolutely is off-premise off advertising. You know, that doesn't, it, that's not a McDonald's. There's not a McDonald's within 10 miles of that, but you put the garden arches on the side of that building from a state law perspective. And I don't, I didn't give you the specific state law um, unless I paraphrased it here. Um, 
you can't have that. That that's considered off-premise advertising because you're you're aver- whether you whether you, whether one wants to call that advertising or not, you're calling attention to something that is off-premise that is not occurring on that site there. So that's why we have some concerns about how much of a of a mural will actually contain that type of image. We totally appreciate and understand where somebody might want that recognition or want to provide maybe the, maybe even. Um, you know, as a thank you, we want to have that type of imagery on there. But how do, how do we limit that? What's the scope of that mural that we can kind of straight face that without somebody saying, oh, that's clearly an advertisement for Google because it has the Google image on the bottom of it or something to that effect. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Ray. Thank you. Um, the only thing I wanted to add was the Bates Public Art Resources map. That this might be a good thing to share with the Harwood Center so they could put that on there as well, is all. Okay, thank you. Councilor Pettengill. Um, so uh, just a couple of things. Um, I'm in 100% support of moving this forward uh, to increase public access to art as easy as possible. I think the more that um, City Hall gets involved in it, the more tedious it becomes and the tougher it is to bring these kind of things to the city. Um, and then in terms of the advertisement, um, not in support of it. Frankly, I don't think that it's going to be an issue. Um, if you go down Lisbon Street now, we have old ads that are on buildings that in no way would I consider them ads now, but they're more of an homage and they're more of art. Um, speaks to the historic lineage of the city. Uh, there's one, um, I forget what it is now, but it, it's the old rails um, of the, the Grand Grand Trunk Depot that's on there. I'd love to see that retouched up. Um, you know, it takes, takes you back a little bit, pays homage to, to the city and where we've been. Um, and what better way to say where we're going than on an old train depot. Um, make this as easy as possible to, to get this off the ground. And if we got to support businesses and let them say, hey, paid for by this. Um, you know, if you look at Philadelphia, they have a mural walk uh, down there. It encompasses a large, so such a large part of the city that there's actually three multiple uh, art walks that you can do. And it takes you through different neighborhoods. And then they've got um, electric box wraps that some businesses have done. There's, there's so much that can be done with this. And it's such an economic driver. Um, it's a, a real missed opportunity um, for us to do that. And then I, I was looking through the documents on there and part of the plan um, says a way to remove the mural um, when it's past its lifetime. We really should talk to legal counsel. Um, last I knew, once a piece of art was put on a property, um, the artist actually owns that space and they, they retain all legal rights to that. Um, so they may not be able to um, even if you just whitewashed it just to, to clean it over, I don't know if, if that's something that that's permissible, but let's, let's make this easy. Okay, thank you, Councilor Khalid. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I agree with um, Councilor Pangil. I think the easier we can make this for folks, the better. Um, approval from code and planning as well as the property owner should be all that, you know, that we require for someone to do a mural in the community. Um, that's it. I'm, I'm glad that this is really coming to our table. Okay, thank you. Uh, we do have one person in the attendees that uh, has raised their hand and I, I believe uh, has had some experience uh, with an attempt to get a mural. So we'll bring Mike in. Our comments uh, are limited to three minutes, uh, Mr. Dosti. So please share your thoughts. Oh, thank you everybody. Um, Mike Dosti, the board chairman of the Downtown Association. Um, I guess, I guess, I, I mean, what I have to say when I'm, when I'm looking at uh, this proposal is I'm, I'm both disappointed and I have some, some pretty major concerns about this. Um, I'm disappointed because um, David referenced uh, inquiries about murals earlier this year. Um, big inquiry was from our association. Um, yeah, and it was a rather unpleasant um, experience. 
Um, I'm, I'm disappointed that Planning and Code has completely ignored all of the input that we've given them, not only through the entire month of March, but when we submitted uh, formal, detailed, uh, articulated uh, proposals ourselves. I don't see any of that included in this. Um, I guess since I've got the floor, I'll ask, I'll ask David. Um, uh, Mike, Mike, if you could, all, all questions need to be directed to me. Okay. And, 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 and then one other thing, any con you can say that you have a concern with a department that's totally appropriate, uh, but we, we can't call out any individual. So, I, and I recognize that's the direction you're going and you had an issue with planning code, but uh, just I keep that in mind. I hear you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I guess, Mr. Mayor, um, here's a question that I've had since um, the end of February that still remains unanswered. If an organization sponsors a mural, can that organization incorporate the business names and or logos with the restrictions that were recommended to planning and code back in March? Um, since I only have three minutes, I won't wait for an answer. I'll, I'll come back. Um, I'm not a fan of having planning and code um, spearheading any kind of mural conversations. Um, I think economic development is much more parallel to the nature of public art. Um, Heidi McCarthy, um, economic development uh, staff is, is on the public art committee. Um, I would say I, the big question I have is why are we proposing so many restrictions uh, not just in the proposal, but also in the modified uh, definitions. I mean, under this proposal, a homeowner in Lewiston would have to ask permission from the city to allow their six-year-old to paint a sunflower on their garage. Um, under this proposal, a, a resident of this city that was big into motorcycles would be prohibited from painting a Harley Davidson on their private property because it would show the Harley Davidson emblem. Um, under these modified definitions, Lewiston could never have a mural of historic downtown because it would show businesses and business logos. Uh, the public theater could never have the, um, the theater comedy tragedy uh, symbol. Um, that wouldn't that wouldn't be allowed as a mural. That would be regulated as a sign. Um, if you took a, an aerial photo of the balloon fest and it happened to show Yvonne's, um, which happens to be right there, um, that, that couldn't be a mural. That would be regulated as a sign. Um, I, I apologize for kind of jumping around. Um, All, right. All right, well, thank you uh, for your comments. So Dennis, I'm gonna go to you. Uh, because uh, Mr. Dosti referenced recommendations they had made, but I'm not sure the council has seen any of that. So, you know, before turning it over to Dave, I guess I'm going to turn it over to you for you to turn it over where you see fit. Well, I, I, I don't think there's any uh, any reason. I think that the planning and code department took the the, the recommendations and comments and reviewed um, all of this. I think uh, Director Hedegar opened it up that this policy was written um, with, under some, some initial legal guidance of trying to meet um, the state laws and rules that we're trying to operate within. So, um, you know, I'm sure those comments, I'll certainly ask Director Hedegar to respond to the recommendations in the sense, um, I'm sure they received them and I'm sure it was reviewed, but if, if Director Hedegar can, uh, you know, just confirm that, uh, that they were reviewed, but I think that at the end of the day, um, what's in this document is is what staff is recommending to be able to remain compliant with state law. All right, thank you. And Director Hedeker, if you could respond to the concerns that he shared, uh, that was shared about, you know, somebody painting a motorcycle that had Harley Davis in it on their garage, that type of stuff. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that's, that's it's an interesting point that Mike raises. I mean, that's certainly not our intent. Um, and, and, yeah, you're right. We're, we're not going around busting some little kid for, for put, painting a, you know, a sunflower on the side of their house. That's not the intent of this. Um, we are absolutely trying to keep it simple. We absolutely took into consideration um, Mr. Dossie's concerns. Um, because we didn't incorporate them doesn't mean that we necessarily didn't review them. Um, 
I think, and certainly um, Mike or myself, I can forward those recommendations to the council so they can look at them. Um, a lot of the recommendations in there, I think were really driven towards the public art process. And as I've noted, we're trying to stay out of the public art process. This is about what's on private property um, and just advising people so they don't go far, too far down a situation where they're gonna have to undo something. Really a advisory in nature. Um, we're trying to make it simple. A lot of the recommendations that um, Mike provided, I think, actually might be um, more in line with what the council or the um, art committee might want to consider with respect to public art and the process involved in that. Um, this really is, it's, it's not as black and white as I would like it to be, or probably as Mike would like it to be. There's lots of case law out there. Um, the example I, I've been sharing with people was there was a case, I think in Florida, where it was a bait shop and the bait shop painted like a fishing, fishing scene on the side of that. And that was deemed as advertising, even though it didn't say anything about, you know, that business there, it was deemed advertising and they ended up having to change it. Um, the example of the public theater is perfect. Um, you know, the tragedy and comedy sim uh, um, symbols there. That's a great question. Is that advertising? Gosh, I would really like for it not to be, but boy, does that tie directly to the public theater and having an image with that? Um, I don't have a good answer for you guys, to be honest with you. I mean, that, that's in my mind, that is totally appropriate. And I also think that could easily be interpreted as signage there as well, as far as you're advertising something there. And that's where it kind of gets into a slippery slope. Um, you know, I, I, I'd have to give that some more thought as to how you would deal with those types of situations. But by no means are we trying to overregulate this. Um, as a couple of counselors said, we're, we're trying to just provide some clarification on the definition side. So we're consistent with state law as to what a sign is and show, come up with a definition of a mural. So there's less of a discussion as to, is it a mural or is it a sign? Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilor Clement. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Three things. I would love to see the recommendations that Mr. Dosti uh, forwarded to the city. Number two, I think uh, if anybody here hasn't heard it before, I wish I could remember which Supreme Court justice said it, that he'd spent an entire life of sheer drudgery, shoveling smoke. That is the law. And finally, I concur with Councillor Pettengill. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Jensen. There you go. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, I guess I'd also be uh, curious to see what the, the recommendations were from that art committee. Um, a uh, question I have too, if we didn't make our policies consistent with state law, um, like if there was an issue with someone like locally doing something that may be possibly violating state law but not violating our own ordinance, would that just mean that like the resident would have to deal with like state and maybe any like judicial consequences and wouldn't have to deal with the city at all? So our ordinance is, um, we, our ordinance as well speaks to off-premise advertising. So you shouldn't be off-premise advertising to begin with. We're trying to clean that up so it's almost verbatim with respect to state law, but you currently can't have off-premise advertising anyway. So regardless of what the state law says, you'd be running into a, a conflict with our existing zoning, zoning and land use language. Okay, so if it was off-premise advertising, like say somewhere like, you know, like Pond Road or something, um, then hmm, the best way to phrase this. Uh, so yeah, so if a person does like, yeah, just say Pond Road off, off-site advertising um, now without any ordinance from the city kind of talking about it, but state law only talking about it, um, that person would only be in trouble with the state and they wouldn't have to deal with the city at all. Is that correct? No, our ordinance has that same language in it now. So you would be in conflict with the state law, excuse me, the local law as well. Our, oh, okay. our, our ordinance is not silent to it, I guess, to try to answer your question. You, regardless of what the state law says, you can't do it in Lewiston currently. So we already have ordinance in place that kind of addresses that? Correct. Okay. Um, and would this be a huge change from that? Uh, no, I mean, you folks have the language in front of you where it shows the struck out and underlying language with respect to our definition of sign. So um, 
basically it's a combination of what our existing language is and what the state language has. Okay. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I guess the point I was getting at is if, if someone's going to be a foul of the state, that's kind of on them. I'd just rather not get the city involved if possible. Um, that's just my, you know, my, my mentality behind that. Um, and thinking too, if we had like, if we have to have the current system or we probably don't have as many murals as we, we should have in the community versus a system where it's almost out of control and there's all this, you know, murals popping up and maybe this borderline advertising going on. I'd be okay with that. That wouldn't be the worst problem, I think, for Lewis and to have, and um, wouldn't be the worst news story about us. So, um, I guess I'm I'm not entirely opposed to you know that that issue happening. I kind of think it'd be a good problem to solve. So, um, if, if that helps provide any guidance. Yeah. Again, our our goal here isn't necessarily to make this difficult. Um, I I know that feeling might not be shared by others, but. Um, we're just trying to avoid a problem from being created. That's all. It, it, it really is advisory. And, we're, and what we're trying to figure out is a way to give this advice before someone proceeds in doing something. Um, again, it really hasn't been a problem. We have murals in town. And uh, you know, a few of them, the most recent one that somebody asked me about, aside from the one Mike's talking about, um, I think was probably Medco on Main Street across from uh, Martin's. Um, you know, they have a mural on the side of their building there and they called and said, Hey, can we do this? Sure. In fact, you could probably advertise on it if you wanted to, if it's related to your business. Um, so. I, I, I wonder, Dave, I mean, I know it's state law on this, the billboard sign state law, but I wonder, have you considered, you know, approaching our delegation about trying to get that law changed so that, uh, you know, so that no way that a sponsor would be considered an app, you know, when in an organization wants to pay to have several murals put up, but, you know, they need to offer people some type of sponsorship. I mean, is that something that you think your department could get behind and advocating for change of that billboard? And, and Dennis, I saw the, the look, so feel free to jump in if that I would only, before Dave responds, I, I think I would advise, I think this direction needs to come from the council first, that that is a desire for staff to, to make that advocate, you know, to advocate for that. Um, I'm not, we haven't received that clear direction. So no, I, I would, I would expect staff haven't, and I would not advise staff doing so without that direction coming from the council first. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, I think Councilor Peckmill had his hand up first. Uh, so just just a couple of quick questions. Um, I would absolutely love for us to be in a situation where the newspaper ran an article that said, ah, I opened up my door and there's just too much art outside. Ah. Um, secondly, have we looked at what other cities are doing? Um, most notably, Philadelphia. Like Philadelphia has a mural arts program that spends that's this is what they do it's a, a philanthropic organization that has I, I think the last time I checked it a couple of years ago the waiting list of buildings to be to have a mural painted on it is years long um, and then uh, just kind of going back to Councillor Jensen's point are we trying to solve a problem that we don't yet have with an onerous system if there's, you know, nobody's jumping out of the woodworks. We've got two murals, which we've pointed out, the zebra and then the nature scape on the side of, of Medco. Um, myself, I can't think of any others that are out there. Um, what, are, what are we doing? And I, I would absolutely love to see the, you know, city staff take a direction on this to try to get the, that change because it's, it's just silly to me. But I'm one guy, so that's that's my take on it. All right, thank you, Councilor Jelinas. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you kind of got at what I wanted to say, but first off, um, I want to thank um, Director Hedeker for the presentation. It uh, was helpful to listen to that perspective for sure. And I understand that you know these are just regs in hopes of keeping us in compliance with the state law. I understand that. Um, However, it's, it, I, I guess I kind of felt like I was surprised it was coming from uh, code and planning. It, again, when I think about public art, which I'm a huge proponent of, I think about that being more closely tied into economic development. Um, 
I, I would also love to see, uh, I wanna thank Mike Dosti for his comments as well. I'd love to see the recommendations that were brought forth. Um, and then lastly, you know, to, um, you know, city administrator Dote's point, I could say as one city councilor, I would definitely be in support of looking at how is it, can we go about approaching delegation to look at some of these laws? Because I think this is a huge thing. I think we're all saying the same thing. We're in support of public art. <laughs> we want to see it happen. And, you know, Councilor Pettengill is straight on, like, wouldn't that be awesome to have a story about way too much art in Lewiston? That'd be great. So I'd love to see that happen. And I just want to put my vote out there. Yeah, and I, so I appreciate acknowledging uh, Director Hedeker's uh, work in this because I truly believe planning and code wants to see more public art in our, our streets. Uh, but, you know, we have a department that the, the, uh, the law is, they're the enforcers, basically. I hate to say it that way, but that's what they, that's what they do. They enforce laws, code enforcement and, and planning uh, and make sure that we're uh, following the prescribed law. So they do it in the sense of reducing liability for our city. Uh, but that clearly sometimes comes in conflict with, you know, moving in a progressive way when it comes to art and other things. But that doesn't change their responsibilities. Uh, so, but uh, so, so uh, a couple of councils here support the idea of us becoming more active and trying to change that law. Is that a general feeling from the council? Can I get nods in general? Okay. You, okay, good. Thank you. All right. Any other, uh, Director Hedegaard, anything else you, you want to share or you all? Um, just, uh, I guess briefly, we did look at a number of communities. Um, I'm aware of Philadelphia's. I haven't looked at their language, but, um, and, and they haven't, I mean, there's a ton of cities that have incredible programs. Uh, I think Oklahoma City is another one. I mean, it's just, it's really impressive what a lot of these communities do. There's also a very, um, they have a lot of rules as to how the process evolves and whatnot. Um, we're not there. Um, I, I, I can appreciate people maybe thinking this is a uh, solution in search of a problem. Um, <laughs> that may not be far from the truth. It was really um, a specific request that triggered this whole discussion here as to when is a mural a sign and, and, and vice versa. Um, Again, I, don't, don't get me wrong. We're not looking to put our fingers into something that we don't need to be getting involved in. We're just trying to provide some clarification. Um, I will, as soon as I'm done with my talk here, I will forward you um, the recommendations from the Downtown Association. Um, and I guess um, at this point, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you folks would like to hold off, but. Um, I guess I'm looking for some guidance as to what the next steps would be from you folks. Well, I'm going to recommend to the council we hold off. I really would like to get just more input and get more knowledge. Uh, the result of the what brought this to, to, to the place where uh, Director Hedegaard is here presenting this was a graffiti covered wall uh, had the opportunity to get public art, but because of the restrictions in place, uh, we could not, they could not put public art there, but yet we still have a graffiti covered wall. And that just doesn't make sense to me. And that's not a criticism because I truly believe code, uh, uh, and I argued for it passionately, I think, you know, that we have to find a way to make this happen, to allow this to happen. But uh, it, there's no criticism here because I think everybody's doing their job. I just think that doesn't make sense to me. And we have to find ways to figure this out, to get rid of graffiti and bring public art to our community. So to, to be clear, there's nothing that keeps anybody from doing a mural right now in Lewis. And the question is whether or not that mural contains advertising. Thank you. Good point. Appreciate that clarification. All right. Uh, so, uh, you know, Director Hedegaard, requested whether we should be moving forward or where, where does the council want to go with this? Do we need more information, more discussion before it's brought has, uh, up to, a, to the table for a vote? If I can, Mayor, maybe, um, you know, Mike raised a lot of good points, I think as well, this is going to relate to your next workshop item, I think. I think there's certainly some overlap here. 
Um, so you might want to hear that discussion. <laughs> you might want to review um, the proposal from the downtown group as well. Um, and then certainly tell me if I'm, um, I'm out of line, Dennis, sort of, or Mayor, as far as, you know, at the end of that discussion, there might be some better guidance from you folks um, as to how you would like us to pursue at this point. Mayor, if I could just jump in, I think Director Hedegar's uh, spot on. Um, that would be my recommendation at this point is to move to the next workshop item unless there's some really pressing items uh, or questions and allow that presentation to go through because these are there's a reason that they're both on here is that they're very closely tied, I think. Um, and there is some overlap here, um, separate issues, but still some overlap that I think would be beneficial for the council. And then I would just recommend as next steps is to allow um, you know, the, the staff to get the feedback from both this workshop and, and uh, the next one, next item. Um, and then I think we could schedule something either even at the July meeting, if, if need be, um, as a follow up, if that's what it takes, or, or shortly, certainly in August, if that's what it takes. But I think quickly, we could turn something back around to have another workshop uh, based on the, the information and feedback. Um, All, right. All right, good. Thank you. I, I like that idea. Uh, Councilor Khalid. I mean, I was just going to give us next steps, but the um, director had a girl already did that. So just okay. waiting on the next workshop. So. Right, thank you. Councilor Pettengill. I'm okay with, with waiting for the next presentation, considering that it's still art related. Um, but I'm still going to support moving forward with, with public art, especially when it's public art that's going to take care of a public nuisance, such as graffiti. Um, you know, and we, we talked about it and we've talked about it at, at length, um, you know, this, this whole council term um, of service delivery. Um, yes, we need to, you know, do the, the proper things, but there, there's also an aspect of it of um, the service that we deliver and, and how we provide that to our constituents as well. Um, so again, I'll, you know, we're, we're going to talk about art in just a couple minutes here, but more art easier, please. Okay, thank you, Councilor Ray. Totally off topic, but I'm gonna switch rooms where I'm taking a call from. I can hear myself on Mike's computer and it's really distracting. Okay. So I'm gonna be off video for a second. All right, sounds good. We're gonna move to uh, item uh, B in our workshop schedule. So, Did we lose, is Dave presenting on this one as well? No, uh, oh. Dale will be bringing in um, Heidi McCarthy yes, to do this I presentation. Do. Um, and this is just uh, an update from the public art working group. They found some challenges, um, you know, through the process. And I think they just have some uh, short and long-term steps uh, that they are recommending them to address these issues. And again, I think there is some uh, close tie to um, what you just heard. So at this point, I see Heidi on video. So I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Heidi. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for letting me speak on this tonight. Um, as uh, City Administrator Dote said, I'm here to talk about the recent momentum in public art in the city and an update on the um, how the public art plan is working out, um, some challenges that we faced, and also to discuss with you a few uh, time sensitive projects. Um, that we uh, may be bringing back to you in July um, for action. So just a little bit of background first. Um, in 2019, the LA Metro Chamber was awarded $75,000 um, as a grant aimed toward utilizing public art as a mechanism for economic development. Uh, as part of that grant, the Public Art Working Group, which I'm gonna call the POG from here on out, was, uh, was formed um, and it was really formed to fulfill the goals of the grant. Um, which included uh, acquiring quality public art for um, the cities of Lewiston and Auburn uh, and um, creating a public art plan uh, to help us move public art forward in the city. Um, through that grant, um, the city council had approved uh, the ledgers installation by Andy Rosen, um, which should be installed uh, in uh, early fall. So look forward to that soon. Uh, and I'm happy to say that the idea of um, 
this grant using public art as a catalyst for economic development, um, there really is significant momentum. We have had several proposals for public art to the city in just the past six months. Um, and all of them have slightly different criteria and considerations. Some are um, private businesses who would like to put um, art on uh, private buildings. Some are um, businesses who would like to use public spaces to create art. Um, and some are uh, projects where people would like to gift art to the city. Um, and I think you'll, you'll see um, when I talk about the, the three pieces later, uh, so, some, of, some of the considerations um, that we've had uh, through this process. Um, the public art plan that um, was passed by the city in 2019 uh, really was a great step and contributed, I, I think, pretty, pretty broadly to the energy that's now present. But we have realized, um, the POG has realized um, that there are some gaps uh, in the process that would be helpful to address. Um, uh, additionally, uh, the POG has realized that it's uh, an advisory committee um, and uh, really that's not why they were formed. Um, so the public art working group is, is recommending that um, the public art plan be strengthened, um, but it also recognizes that it doesn't have the time to complete the grant requirements, advise on these several projects for the city, and also um, create um, a more robust plan. So uh, they're recommending that a consultant um, in partnership with LA Arts does that work while engaging the folks who need to be involved when they need to be involved. And that includes city council, city staff, um, the public, um, other people that, that may need, other stakeholders that may, may need to have input on the process. Um, and in your packet, there's a proposal from Becky Conrad to complete the work um, through grant funding that she and LA Arts would acquire. Um, also uh, in that proposal, uh, you'll see a sample public art plan, um, as well as the public art plan that was uh, uh, approved back in December, um, which uh, 2019. And it illuminates some of the important details that um, we are missing in our plan. Um, one of which is a process for when people would like to propose art, how they do that. And this speaks, I think, to um, Councillor Pettengill's uh, earlier comments, uh, and I think a few other councillors about making it easier um, to do art in the city. I think one of the things that's holding us back right now and delaying projects is that we don't have that process in place that will allow us, uh, allow the POG um, and the city to do an evaluation to make sure that it's a project that uh, is going to um, be beneficial to the goals of the city. So some of the important details that could be included um, are like different acquisition scenarios, um, how and when uh, a piece would need to be removed and who makes that decision and when, um, who is in charge of maintenance and how does that maintenance get done? Uh, what is the liability to the city of certain projects? Um, and uh, again, that clear process for people who are interested in creating public art. Um, and I wanna be clear too that this, this public art plan would mostly cover projects that are either city owned or um, owned but owned by someone else but are on city property. Um, it, private um, private uh, buildings and businesses who would like to create public art um, can still engage uh, the POG for, uh, for assistance with process if they, are, if they are looking for guidance on how to do public art because a lot of, a lot of developers and um, private businesses have never done that sort of work. So they can still engage, but the processes here would really be for um, those type of uh, city projects. Uh, so tonight um, I'm asking for feedback from the council on whether you think this method of moving forward with um, a consultant to create a more robust plan, um, which would help us streamline processes while also being mindful of city interests and considerations is something that you, you are interested in. It would, the plan itself would come back to you in December for, for your review and approval. Um, but in July, um, I would like to bring forth, um, uh, depending on your feedback, um, um, action for your, um, for your uh, support of the process, if that's something that you are indeed interested in, so that we have that to move forward. Uh, I do have those few projects to discuss tonight. Um, but would you like me to pause here for questions on the public art plan uh, before I continue to those three uh, public art pieces? All right, let's see if the council, any questions so far or comments, council? Councilor Ray? 
Thank you for the presentation. Um, so this part is to consider whether or not moving the parts of the public art working group work to a consultant. Is that the question? When it comes to the public art plan specifically, the, the public art working group would still um, be looking at those uh, projects that are coming to the city. Um, and and we, we are starting to sort of come up with a, a process that will help get us more information um, at the beginning uh, so that we, we can make uh, a better recommendation to the city. But um, what I'm asking for tonight is just about the public art plan being moved to um, the consultant. I, I think that would be appropriate. I think, you know, the only flag that I could possibly think of is we want local folks who know the scene around here to be participating in, in what actually becomes the public art around here. Um, I think if we're looking at plans and trying to assess other city plans and working those in, that seems appropriate for a consultant to do, in my opinion. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Council of Gelines. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Heidi, for that presentation. I would just say that I'm very much in support of the public art group bringing forth the public art plan for us to review. Um, you know, and, I, and I'm figuring the composition of that group would really be able to address some of the concerns that Councillor Ray brought up. So um, you have a strong yes from me. Thank you, Councillor Khalid. Thank you. Um, just some comments and one question. Does the public art committee, do they get like a stipend? Because, you know, a lot of the time, some people don't have the time or the commitment to really like intentionally do a lot of this work that is demanding. So I'm just wondering if they, I don't know, get some sort of stipend for the work that they do. They do not. They were, uh, so the public art working group um, that is currently in place until December um, is uh, an appointed group. Um, people were appointed by mayors of both cities to be a part of this to administer the grant. Um, in the future, the current public art plan calls for a public art committee um, as opposed to the public art working group. I feel, like, feel like we need to differentiate those terms better, um, but uh, it calls for a public art committee to be formed. Uh, and at the time that the public art plan was made, the, the makeup of that committee was going to be the same, but I think with lessons learned from doing the ledgers project, as well as these projects that we're currently evaluating, that's something that might change in the plan also to make sure that um, we have all the voices at the table that need to be for a full evaluation of the project. So. Short answer is no, they did not get a stipend. It's an appointed position. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, hiring a consultant to really better the process for art submission is a great idea. Um, I'm wondering who will make the decision, like how, the, how will they get paid and like how much all of that? Would, would the group make that decision or I'm just trying to see who makes the decision. The sure, so idea. Becky Conrad has um, put a proposal into LA Arts, um, who has been a great partner through the process. Um, and they are proposing that um, Becky and LA Arts will find the funding for it. Um, and uh, I believe um, the POG will, does not have any input into um, how the, uh, the cost um, structure is for the um, proposal, but um, I will say that the POG has all looked at the proposal and given feedback on it. So, um, so there has been that, but the the consultant fees are not something that um, that we have waited on. Oh, okay. Um, and lastly, I think just the city overall just needs like better marketing and advertising, whether on you know for people to submit whatever through the website or. or our different social media pages. So even if the consultant can help with that, just a little in terms of the art submission, um, that's something that I would like to see. But thank you so much, Heidi, for your presentation. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Councilor Jensen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'm also in support of moving forward with using a consultant, um, especially if it is funding, funded through uh, grants. So uh, great work. Thank you. All right. Uh, so you, we're all set if you could move to your next phase and uh, we are running behind schedule. So I just share that with you. Sure, I'll make it fast because these are coming back to you in July um, for, for action. Um, uh, but there are three public art pieces that um, are really time sensitive uh, and uh, 
One is, has to do with our choice um, grant. So this is um, the choice planning and action grant, not the new implementation grant. Uh, this is the, the old one that helped us get the implementation grant. A um, million dollars of that was allocated for action activities to make physical improvements to the neighborhood. And a portion of that um, will be set aside or has been set aside to provide um, sculptures and murals for the um, choice neighborhood. So these projects will be city owned um, and be installed mostly on city owned vacant lots and be able to be moved as, um, as those lots are redeveloped for housing. Um, this, is, this is a place where the public art working group is going to be heavily involved because um, we are working through the RFP process for this project. Uh, we recently went to the finance committee who has um, granted permission to use the same structure that we used for the ledgers project, um, which is the Fox sculptures um, that Andy Rosen will be uh, putting in uh, to the canals uh, in September or in early fall. And uh, uh, the final part of that would be that uh, as, the, as the finalists are chosen, they would come to the council for approval at that time. So, um, so that's the process that would be used for that. Uh, so what we'll be asking for in July is um, support of that process and um, ownership and maintenance of, of the new pieces. Okay. I'll, I'll just go to, oh, I'm sorry, Mayor. No, nope, go ahead. Okay, I'll just, I'll go to the next one. Um, Carl Shaleen, who owns Mooka Coworking, which is uh, right down the street from City Hall uh, on the corner of Pine and Lisbon, um, has a proposal uh, to uh, in, to do a painted installation on the city owned bench and sidewalk outside of Munka. Um, he, he will be able to provide a sketch of the concept uh, in your July 13th packet. Uh, he, ha he will contract with an artist um, to create something that, um, that, that will activate the space, but won't be directly connected to Munka. Um, it, the um, installation does coincide with the reopening of Munka after the pandemic. Um, so uh, it, it, that is, um, th those two things will be happening in tandem. And what we'll be asking for um, at the July 13th, 13th meeting is um, for the council's consideration and approval, um, the maintenance and funding for that would come from uh, Mr. Shaleen and Munka co-working and um, not from the city, but because it's city owned property, we would be asking for permission for that. And the third one, um, this project, the women's suffrage mural actually came to you back in January. Um, and I'm happy to say that um, Lewiston was chosen as the site and uh, a, an artist has been chosen. And there is a uh, mock-up of that in your uh, packet also. Um, so what we'll be asking for uh, on July 13th is um, your consideration and potential approval for uh, that concept to be installed. Um, and hopefully it will be installed by November um, as the grant that is paying for it uh, suggests. Thank so, you so much for sharing that publicly for the first time, I think, if I, yeah. All right, is that it, Heidi? That is, yes, those, those are the three pieces. All right, any uh, brief questions or comments from the council? Okay, uh, thank you, Heidi. That's, uh, that's really good news for the community to hear this evening. Thank you so much. All right. See, Administrator Dote. Uh, I was just going to suggest the mayor as we're at seven o'clock, I didn't know what you wanted to do um, with item C. Um, may recommend we can either go over the, the workshop time or just move this to the end of the meeting. Um, it, it's your call, but I just wanted to yeah, I think, you know, I think this is important because I think there's uh, discussions happening around the community around this and regionally. So, uh, Heather, I, uh, Director Hunter, if you could just try to be brief, but thorough and okay. Certainly, I'm going to share my screen to kind of go through the presentation. Um, and then it's mainly soliciting, there's some suggestions within the presentation and soliciting, soliciting feedback for the council. So at some point in the future, we can accept and appropriate these funds. So hopefully we'll get. So do you all see the presentation? We do. Okay, better than that than my granddaughter. So that's good. <laughs> So um, this is regarding the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, 
just so everybody is aware. Um, Lewiston received just shy of $21 million. It's split between two um, $10 million, $485,000 payments uh, that we receive now once we accept and log in. And again, in May, 2022, some key dates to look at is costs that are eligible for these various funding sources. We can go rat retroactive back to March 3rd of 2021. As a city, we need to obligate funds by December 31st, 2024, and everything needs to be completely liquidated as it stands now by 2026. So there's four funding categories and, and that's what the next slide. So essentially these slides are designed that the top part kind of tells you what criteria are eligible and then the orange criteria are the orange items kind of um, solicit from staff and, and departments and so forth what we we as the city of Lewiston might use some of these funding sources for. So it's it's just sparking the conversation. So the first conversation or the first category is public health response. That talks about ventilation improvements in key settings, that talks about mental health treatment and crisis intervention and the ability to address the long-term health impact of COVID. Um, reviewing suggestions from staff and so forth. Obviously, the city council approved in the current FY22 budget um, funding for the crisis workers that has a range between 98,000 and 135,000. Um, recognizing if we elect to use this money for this purpose, after 2024, it would revert, revert back to a general fund cost if we were would be continuing um, using that service. Ventilation improvements to several public municipal buildings, whether it be the library, city hall, the armory, any of those public buildings. This particular category also allows for third party assistance as well, but it may be difficult to see how, um, how we're going to vet and screen which third party um, businesses or event areas that we would want to fund and which ones we won't. And we've kind of generally set a price tag of a million dollars for our municipal public buildings, armory, library, city hall, those types of things. The last kind of suggestion that falls under this category is the upgrade of code and licensing software. And right now we have a system that has been in place for a while. It was a partnership with the city of Auburn way back when. And it is kind of limited on the extraction of data. It, it ties some hands on the ability to really start um, being more um, responsive when businesses key in um, code and licensing issues um, whether it be with code and then or the licensing side in the city clerk. So this has the ability to enhance public health response and it assists with the impacts of businesses if we are to move forward and then we need to send out responses and so forth. The value of that software and implementation between um, conversion and one-time setup costs is about a $60,000 price tag. There is a part B in this category that address, uh, addresses negative economic impacts. And under this, we talk about assistance for unemployed workers through job training, support for small businesses with grants versus loans, um, looking at the recovery of tourism traffic and hospitality se sectors, rebuilding public capacity. And that again is dealing with the unemployment side of things and then looking at housing assistance, educational assistance, childcare assistance, using the qualified census tracts. And those are the same qualified census tracts that the community development block grant funds use. So they're, they're exactly the same na um, nature with this. Some suggestions that came up here looks at reimbursing general fund for security deposits and motel stays during the pandemic. Right now, um, the state is 
paying the 70% of this. So our share would be approximately $11,000. We are able to address 75% of the social services director's salary, which has just shy of a $78,000 price tag. And then looking at third-party assistance, home ownership, gap financing, daycares, and so forth. Um, again, we would have to come up with a process of an application screening process on how we were going to move forward with this. This has some um, documentation um, qualifications that we would need to consider if we went into, wanted to go that route as far as documentation and reporting requirements. The second category talks about uh, replacing lost revenues. Um, this is probably an area I'm going to be most negative on because I think it's unfortunate the way they calculated this. Is you need to use a stat shot of your full fiscal year prior to the pandemic. So with the city of Lewiston, that would be 2019's numbers. So our actual amount was a little more than $70 million. And then you take snapshots, and this is all prescribed by the regulations within these funding sources. You're taking snapshots at December 31st for 2021, 20, 22, and 23. And we are allowed the, a growth factor not to exceed 4.1%. So if we look at the snapshot at December 31st, 2020, our actual amount was about $75 million. Using the growth factor times the snapshot date, which is the June 19th number times the number of months that has expired, which is 18, our growth amount is 74,373, leaving us a positive variance of $725,000. So what this means is the city does not qualify to use any of this grant to replenish lost revenue sources. And you will see the limitations in the calculations as I've outlined below is the regulations require us to look at general fund revenues in totality versus specific categories. We know parking revenue is an issue. We know um, traffic enforcement is an issue. Um, so that is, is a limitation. And because of that, and you might recall this from the first budget when most of you came on, we reduced the general fund revenues based upon what we anticipated with the pandemic, but we adjusted the tax rate. So the net total general fund revenues at, in actuality stayed virtually the same. So it makes it very difficult um, to recognize if we did not take conservative budgeting, we would have probably qualified more, but then that puts us in a whole different um, danger. So it, it's unfortunate. And then I jokingly kind of put in the quip that what large governmental entity uses a calendar year because there's nobody. The federal doesn't use it, the state doesn't use it, and very few, unless you're a small municipality, use a December 31st. So why they use that as a snapshot is, is quite a puzzlement. The third category is recognizing the premium pay for essential workers. So there's a, a few nuances um, in the regs regarding this. First, they must be physically present in their job to qualify for this. Remote working does not qualify. Most regularly, um, uh, these persons are performing these duties in person, at work, interacting with others, or handling items handled by others. You're talking about the library, handling books. At the treasurer's office, you're handling you know, documents and money and th those types of things. In this particular case, as in the other categories, we may assist third-party employers with grants, but again, we would need to um, require additional reporting requirements. And, and that's the balance that we would have to go through. And again, how do you vet applications on who you would apply to for this and who, who wouldn't you apply? So right now for the local level in the municipality, 
We're looking at reimbursing possibly for the police payout, which was approximately $74,000. And any contemplation for future payments of other employees that we've set a general price tag of $120,000. Recognizing based upon the regulation, not all of that would be completely eligible for grant reimbursement. Item four of the, of the four categories is the investment in water and sewer and broadband. Quite frankly, this is the easiest area to establish projects under, and it also um, it establishes recognized needs within the community for infrastructure. The three that are listed there include the CSO storage at, at the Water Pollution Control Authority, that's got about a $15 million price tag, and then the water, a redundant water transmission main, again, that same price tag. Uh, and those have both been in the LCIP. Those are projects the council is familiar with. They come with significant price tags. These are 20 year projects that the debt service on there is, is going to reach probably in the neighborhood, depending on when we sell it, in the neighborhood of a couple million dollars in interest alone, if not well beyond that. So this using these as an option for funding allows the city to avoid issuing debt service, which has been a criticism across the board with the rating agency. It keeps our user rates um, relatively current and not significantly impacted by the debt service of these two projects. And then the third option obviously is the significant savings and debt service interest. Recognizing there is now a, a third or a fourth contemplation going on is a regional initiative. The mayor and administration from the city of Auburn had kind of a brainstorming session a couple of weeks ago. Um, Councilor LaJoy and I attended on behalf of the city. There was delegation from the legislative body. There was um, the county representation, chamber representation, AVCOG representation, and of course the city of Auburn. And I think I may be forgetting some, but that generally is who attended this meeting. And what their goal was is this is a, you know, a once in a lifetime, so to speak, pot of money that is coming into their region. Should, be, should we be considering a larger regional project that has something that really benefits the whole region that none of us may not experience in our lifetime if we did not have these funds available. So they're seeking ideas of what that regional project or combination of projects might be. Recognizing this path of using this money may require deadlines to be extended because you've got to gain those ideas, you've got to vet them, you've got to get price tags involved, we've got to see, you know, anybody that's involved in the region has to get their local um, governing bodies permission and approval to use those funds for that. So that that's all going to extend the lead time with that. Based upon some of the ideas that came up at that meeting, we may have to seek a waiver of acceptable uses for the categories because some of the ideas that they were thinking of do not fit in one of those four categories at this juncture. So we would have to use our legislative delegation to look at a waiver and, and kind of the sales pitch would be, this is a regional effort, this entire region elected to go this route. And for that, we would like to use that money for B instead of A or, and that's kind of um, the thought process behind that. My general concern after leaving that meeting is we need to draft an MOU or a joint development or a joint agency agreement, something of that early on for a variety of reasons. Because once, every, once that item, whatever it gets, 
or whatever it is gets approved, then you've got the whole dialogue of where is it going to be located and who's going to get the taxes on it and all of that, who's going to run it, you know, all of that administrative, um, the devil's in the detail type items. So again, it, it, go, it shoots back to that second bullet that the deadlines may need to be expended, extended because obviously that's going to get take time. So just to kind of share with you kind of the ideas that were thrown out during that meeting is looking at regional transportation, um, food distribution sis, uh, system, dry and cold storage, a slaughterhouse, a hops processing plant based upon the microbreweries in the area. Looking at if we look at the airport, you know, hangar development, an aviation charter school, those types of projects kind of were just tossed out in a brainstorming session. But they're looking at having another one of these meetings probably in about six weeks and asking to bring ideas back um, for anybody that attends that meeting at that point in time. If in fact the council does not want to use this funding for what was kind of outlined on the first several slides, you know, with our local city of Lewiston projects. Or we could establish a budget that kind of combines a little bit of everything. So that in a nutshell is wrapping that up. And now I need to see. Dennis, how do I get rid of this? I'll pull it down. Stop share. There we go. There you go. <laughs> you have to wait till you get all the way out before you get that little note. <laughs> so at that point in time, I guess I would seek council feedback. So I'm sorry, I was muted, uh, Councilor Khalid. Thank you, Mayor. Um, two questions, Heather. One is for the regional initiatives. Um, I know you, you mentioned state delegation and city administration. Are the public invited into those meetings for input? Um, at this point, they were initially sticking with the, the kind of the invitees of the first meeting until they see what kind of ideas are generated and then they're opening that up. Um, this is being led right now by the city of Auburn and, and the mayor and administration over there. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is, we all know that a young girl passed away um, last week um, because she drowned, she couldn't swim. So I'm wondering, are we able to use some of this funding to reopen the pool in a downtown area and hire a staff person? That is something that we can, right now, I'm a little bit concerned of how it fits in, but we may be able to um, pigeonhole it in one of the first two categories and reach out to the delegation to kind of get that specific approval on that or if they see any concerns with that funding. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilor Ray. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so one idea that's just been bouncing around my head for a while, um, I went to a Choice Neighborhood brainstorming event oh, pre-pandemic and we had talked about, and there was a consultant there talking about um, citywide or neighborhood-wide Wi-Fi projects. Um, and so I know at the very least the ball was rolling on some research about that. Um, I have no concept of what the cost of that would be, but I'm curious if that could possibly be added to the list. I think coming out of the pandemic, we realized, especially on the school side, but also for um, constituents, connectivity isn't always the best for folks around here. Um, and even though we're not rural, our broadband systems aren't quite up to snuff. And so I guess I'm curious if that could possibly fall within 
or it's also entirely possible that the cost is just way exorbitant, even with this extra funding. And I, and I can appreciate that. I, in initial discussions and that we may need to do a deeper dive with that, this is very specific on upgrading speeds of the Wi-Fi and, and not necessarily creating new hotspots and things like that. And I think that's and and and, and the cost association associated with that. Um, that tends to be the limitation that people are seeing with the Wi-Fi piece of this funding source. But okay, can definitely look into that a little bit more as well. Yeah, I, I just think there has been some research done already. So if we could tap into that, um, and then I just wanted to to throw some support uh, behind the CSO storage as well as the uh, water line redundancy. Um, I think those, it would be incredible to keep that debt service off of our books um, and have those really important things that they're, they're not a problem now. And we keep pushing, I feel like we keep pushing off those planning um, pieces because they're not a problem now, but as soon as they become a problem, they're a very large one. So um, why not uh, insulate ourselves a little bit better moving forward? Thank you so much for this though. And just, just to add to Heather's, uh, Director Hunter's answer in reference to broadband, uh, I was having a conversation with uh, Representative Cludia. Apparently the state is, is gonna be using a lot of their funding to uh, increase broadband statewide. So we definitely would wanna check with them first before we you know, commit in that area. Uh, Councilor Pattengill. Thank you. Um, so just to kind of echo off what Councilor Ray was saying, um, I'm in support of moving forward with taking care of the, the CSO pot, uh, project and the, the redundant water line. Um, you know, we, we run into the, this thing where Lewiston spends a lot of time um, taking care of other, other cities and, and the services that we provide for others that come here. Um, but I, I think it's time at this moment that we should really take a look at uh, doing something for ourselves first. Um, you know, the, the CSO and, and the water line, these are two gigantic things that are, that are hanging over our heads right now um, that are, are drastic needs in this city just to ad address basic functions. Um, the, the one thing I am curious to, to hear about is the regional transportation. Um, but other than that, you know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put all my, my support behind taking care of, of us and doing those two projects. Okay, thank you, Councillor Jensen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I would concur with uh, my councillors that I'd support something like working on the CSO project with this funding. Um, the way I'm kind of looking at it is, um, I'd rather have us do less spending on any type of, you know, providing social services and focus more on like needed expenses here in the city. You know, we've had to make up for what the state and federal government's not provided us and what they should have for, you know, many, many years now. So um, I'd, I'd much rather us use this money to focus on ourselves and make up what we need to. Um, yeah, so like, I mean, I don't really, you know, support spending on, on any recurring items that would otherwise be added to future budgets. Um, I'm not entirely convinced that a regional project's a great idea without having a project already in mind that the entire region's already kind of determined that we want to go towards. Um, I just worry about kind of, committing ourselves to something that we're not really sure we even want to do. Um, and I'm not entirely sure that with a regional project, we'd get a proper return on the investment anyways, because it all depends on where that location, you know, it's located. Um, and that could, you know, benefit wherever that is locally, but not necessarily Lewiston if it's not in Lewiston. Um, so that, that gives me a lot of pushback there. Although I do like the idea and I love the, the uh, creative thinking that's going on behind that. So I, I definitely want to encourage that because I do like the idea of regional thinking. Um, as crazy as our county system is in Maine and how dysfunctional it is, um, there is benefit to regional cooperation. So maybe if Maine had like 30 counties, that system could work better, but that's another tangent. Um, I do like the idea of, of giving retroactive hazard pay to city staff. I mean, a lot of our city staff have worked pretty hard at, in some pretty wild conditions. And so um, I, I definitely think we should do right by them, especially being a city council, you know, employing staff in the city. We want to do right by them. So I, I definitely support that. Um, so all that kind of to say that overall, I'd support using the money mo for, uh, first and foremost for the CSO, um, you know, I should say the, the, the lock up uh, project to kind of work at that, prevent any future debt from happening. Um, 
as much as possible. And so I think it'd be a good investment for the city going forward and probably one of the best things we can do for our taxpayers. So of course I'm open to ideas, but that's generally how I'm approaching this. So thank you. I'm, uh, I'm encouraged to hear folks talking about uh, the CSO and the water line. A little different opinion on which one is a priority. I think the water line, you know, has got to be a priority because if something happens to that line, and that could happen in the blink of an eye because well over 100 years old, I believe. Uh, but either way, both projects are going to be significant to our community. So either one would be, uh, I think, uh, a, a great help to us. Uh, Councilor Clement? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would concur that uh, looking at some of these so-called, I guess, brick and mortar issues would be far more beneficial to the city in our current situation than looking at some of the social issues that are out there. I mean, there are great needs all the way around, but these two projects in and of themselves overshadow uh, what money we're going to be getting from the feds. And they're just one of two government levels that hand off all of these edicts to us time and time again, and they say, here, do it. Uh, we can't pay for it. You take care of that. So let's move forward to some of these major projects. Uh, Councillor Jensen brought up uh, an important thing. I think we'll be addressing that perhaps a little later on this evening. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then real quick before we move on, uh, I think the uh, making our employees whole through the pandemic, I think should be absolute priority, broad base. We look at everyone. Uh, so thank you for bringing that up, uh, whoever, I think Councilor Jensen brought it up, so. All right, is there any other questions or comments? Uh, all right, with that said, do, do we need a, uh, are we all set to move right into the meeting? Okay, seeing nods, uh, we will do that. So quickly for uh, folks who may have joined, uh, just recently, uh, welcome to the June 15th uh, City Council Business Meeting. Uh, this session will be conducted remotely and council members will only participate electronically. Uh, if by chance you, uh, I'm sorry, uh, please ensure that you joined uh, this meeting using www.lewistonmain.gov slash 2021 CC. If by chance you used any other link, we encourage you to log on to that website and use the link. And then real quick, any public comments uh, can be sent to public comment at lewistonmain.gov prior to or during the meeting and all comments received will be forwarded to the city council. And the public is encouraged to make comments. Uh, you'll have to raise your hand, be acknowledged, and then uh, it has to be, uh, in, during the public comment period, it has to be anything that is not on the agenda. Once we get to agenda items uh, and all public comments uh, will be a maximum of three minutes. Okay, with that said, we'll move to an update on city actions regarding COVID-19. Well, Mr. Mayor, there's just a couple brief things. Um, last week, the city removed its state of emergency. Um, the public won't see any difference. That really authorized the administrator and staff to make quick um, decisions that typically would go to council, but during, during an emergency, we had to do very quickly. So given where we are with the pandemic, um, that, that's been removed and the public won't really see any change. Um, the state state of emergency has been extended one more time to June 30th, um, and this appears to be the last extension. There's a couple of ramifications around that. One, our public meetings will need to move back into person within the next 30 days or 30 days after June 30th. Um, so we'll be having conversations with the council and our other boards. Some have moved already back and committees, um, but everybody will need to move back. Um, social distancing indoors and outdoors as of June 30th um, is no longer necessary, neither are capacities. Um, masks, we're evaluating those. Um, there are no requirements for masks going forward, but there are recommendations and entities can make their own rules depending on how things move forward. So we'll be discussing that coming up fairly quickly, how we're gonna operate within the city hall. Um, that's pretty much it that's gone on the last couple of weeks. Okay, thank you. Questions or comments from the council? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, if you could just call the roll for attendance. Sure, uh, Councillor from Ward 1. Present. 
Ward two. Here. Ward three. Present. Ward four. Present. Ward five. Present. Ward six. Present. And Ward seven. Present. Also in attendance this evening, Mr. Mayor is Dennis Dote, City Administrator, Dale Dowdy, Deputy City Administrator, Heather Hunter as the Finance Director, and myself as the City Clerk. All right, thank you very much. Uh, first item up is a presentation of a scholarship award from the Lewiston Firefighters Association. And I believe Dottie Whitten Perrier and uh, Rick Kai, the LFD union president, will be presenting. It should be on their way in. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, Dottie, when you're ready. Uh, good evening. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just wanted to say a few words about the Lewiston Youth Advisory Council. It's now in its 20th year. And in the last few years, we've been very fortunate to have the Lewiston Firefighters Association serve as the group sponsor. And they have also, for the last few years, provided an annual scholarship to a Lewiston senior on the Youth Council who has really contributed to his or her community. Um, in a great manner. And this year it's Ariana Valley. We have eight seniors that just recently graduated and six of them applied for the scholarship. And uh, we recently had a meeting and I'll turn it over to Rick again. Thank you so very much, Rick Kaye from the LFA for providing this opportunity to LEAC seniors. So I'll turn it over to you. I know Ariana is here as well and uh, over to you, Rick, and we do have a, a certificate for Ariana. Great. Want to make sure you can hear me? We can. Okay. Uh, well, it's, it's an honor to be present tonight. As all of us, I'm sure you, we wish we were in person. Uh, on behalf of the Wilson Firefighters Association, we're proud to award the 2021 Youth Advisory Scholarship to Ariana. The selection process this year was particularly difficult and all youth advisory members who dedicated their time to the youth council deserve recognition for their commitment to making our city a better place. As I reviewed the submissions, Ariana, your essay and your chosen field of study seemed very appropriate as we struggled with COVID-19. Dedicating your life to the care of others as a nurse is both noble and so necessary. You commented on your wish to make every opportunity to learn new things. Ariana's success in life is often directed by the will to be continually embracing just not the new, but often the uncomfortable. All the men and women of the IFF Local 785 wish you the best as you move forward. Congratulations. All right. Thank you. And uh, I'm sure the council uh, is appreciative to one at uh, Lewiston Fire Department Union for uh, continuing to provide this service. It's been years and the amount of money they provided to students has been uh, uh, very helpful. And this year, uh, providing it to a potential nurse who will stay in Lewiston and work in Lewiston, I thought that was pretty exciting as well. So on behalf of the council, I'd like to congratulate Ariana for the hard work and getting the scholarship and we wish her well in college. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, roll call votes. Sure, all roll call votes for this meeting will begin with the Councilor of Ward 6. All right, I'll entertain a motion to accept the minutes of June 1st and June 8th, 2021. I'll move, Mr. Mayor. Okay, moved by Councilor Gelinas, seconded by Councilor Clement. Uh, if there are no noted changes, uh, call the roll, please. To our council from Ward 6? Yes. Ward seven? Yes. Ward one? Yes. Ward two? Yes. Ward three? Yes. Ward four? Yes. And ward five? Yes. Motion passed by vote of seven to zero. Okay, thank you. We're in public comment period. Any member of the public may make comments regarding issues pertaining to Lewiston city government. 
it'd be a maximum of three minutes and uh, public comment for this period should be on items that are not on the agenda. Okay, not seeing any hands raised. Okay, we'll bring it back to the uh, council consent agenda. Sure, there are three items on the consent agenda this evening. Item number one, amendment to the traffic schedule regarding loading zones on Lisbon Street. Number two, order authorizing application and acceptance of funds from the US Department of Justice, Edward Byrne Justice Assistant Grant Program. And item number three, order authorizing execution of municipal quick claim deeds for real estate located at 16 Merton Boulevard, 52 Oxbow Drive, and 4 Galena, Ave uh, 4 Galena Lane. Move for passage, Mr. Mayor. Second. Okay, moved uh, by Councilor Clement, seconded by Councilor Gelinas. Call the roll, please. Councilor from Ward 6? Yes. Ward 7? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. Ward 2? Yes. Ward 3? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. And Ward 5? Yes. Motion passed by vote of 7 to 0. All right, thank you. Agenda item number 4. Item number four, public hearing on the renewal application for a special amusement permit for live entertainment for the cage 97 through 99 Ash Street. Requested action to grant a special amusement permit for live entertainment to the cage 97 through 99 Ash Street. So moved. Second. Okay, moved by Councilor Ray, seconded by Councilor Jensen. Uh, with that, we'll open the uh, public hearing. Are there any comments from the public in reference to this special, uh, in reference to this renewal application for a special amusement permit? Okay, seeing none, I'll bring it back to the council. Any questions or comments from the council? Okay, with that, I'll close the uh, public hearing. Call the roll, please. Council from Ward 6? Yes. Ward 7? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. Ward two? Yes. Ward three? Yes. Ward four? Yes. And Ward five? Yes. Motion passed by vote of seven to zero. Thank you. Agenda item number five, please. Item number five, public hearing on the renewal application for a special amusement permit for live entertainment for Sonder and Dram, 12 Ash Street. Requested action to grant a special amusement permit for live entertainment to Sonder and Dram, 12 Ash Street. So move, Mr. Mayor. Second. Okay, moved by Councilor LaJoy, seconded by Councilor Jensen. With that, I'll open the public hearing. Councilor Ray? Just letting everyone know that I will be recusing myself from conversation and voting on this due to a conflict. Okay, thank you. Uh, to the public, any public comments in reference to the renewal application for Sonder and Graham? Okay, seeing none, back to the council. Call the roll, please. Councilor from Ward 6? Yes. Ward 7? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. Ward 2? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. And Ward 5? Yes. Motion passed by 6 to 0. Okay, thank you. Agenda item number 6, please. Item number 6, public hearing and first passage for amendments to the election ordinance regarding the creation of an affidavit of residency. Requested action that the proposed amendment to the City Code of Ordinances, Chapter 32, Elections, Article 1 in general, Section 32-5, Affidavit of Residency, receive first passage by a roll call vote and to continue the public hearing to the next regularly scheduled City Council meeting. Okay. So we'll Moved by Councilor Gelinas. Second. Second. Seconded by Councilor Clements. Uh, with that, I'll open the uh, public hearing. And uh, Dennis, do you want to, or City Administrator Dote, do you want to introduce this? Or uh, just briefly, um, this item was a workshop in the June 1st uh, City Council workshop. Um, and what this does is establishes a affidavit that uh, would be residency affidavit that would be signed by the candidates for Office of Mayor, City Council, or School Committee um, as part of the nomination process. And that was uh, presented to the council by Councillor Clement. Anything you want to add to that, Councillor Clement? 
No, sir, not at this time. I'll await any public comment. If uh, none there, then we can move along, but I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Questions or comments from the council? Councilor Ray. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I wanted to check on a couple of things. Um, oh, sorry, raising my hand again. Um, I asked this during the workshop, but I did want to clarify and see if there might be a need to codify this, um, that the city clerk's office will notarize the residency in order to um, exempt anyone from having to pay for that. Uh, count, uh, Mr. Mayor, if I may, Councillor, it is a, a practice. It's been a past practice. I mean, I've been here for 20 years and that was a practice on the books when I was here. So um, we've, we've notarized election related items for the public for free if it's related to city business such as municipal elections. I don't foresee that, that changing at all. Thank you. And then um, I personally will be voting against this. I feel that it adds a burden to folks. Um, I think the charter is clear that you just have to be 20 years of age and live in your ward, which I, I do think is important to live in the ward that you represent. But um, this this feels an undue burden to, to folks who um, are possibly in lower income brackets, who have unstable housing, or even just renters in general, of which our city is 50% renters. So um, I intend to vote against. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments from the council? Okay, seeing none, this is a public hearing. Any comments from the public? Okay, seeing none, back to the council. Councilor Clement. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, if the objection from the council in Ward 3 is to the notification, as I believe it was before, I believe notification could be as simple as a telephone call to the clerk indicating that there's been a change in residence. I don't think there's anything, any convoluted process necessary. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I do have a hand raised in the public. Uh, Alem Vassal, good evening. Good evening, how are you, sir? Good evening, well, sir. So three minutes, feel free to share your thoughts on this, sir. Um, I was wondering, as as a collective, what you guys are doing towards bettering the school system, because there's a lot of stuff that's going on, especially the COVID-wise, that's affecting students' learning. Okay. And I was wondering what you guys could do to better the environment for them. All right. So, uh, so we have some really strict rules, public comment for items that are not on the agenda happened at the beginning of the meeting. And now, right. now we're discussing a much different subject. What I'm gonna encourage you to do is maybe email uh, the counselor from Ward 3 or city staff with your question. Counselor from Ward 3 is our school committee representative. Uh, so I would encourage you to either email directly city staff, they'll forward your question to the appropriate person, or you could email directly to Counselor Ray. So. Thank All right, thank you. All right. All right, thank you. Okay, back to public comment in uh, related to the election ordinance regarding the creation of an affidavit of residency. Are there any other public comments? Okay, seeing none, back to the council. Call the roll, please. Councilor from Ward 6? Yes. Ward 7? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. Ward two? Yes. Ward three? No. Ward four? Yes. And ward five? Yes. Motion passed by vote of six to one. Okay, thank you. Agenda item number seven, please. Item number seven, order authorizing transfer of surplus funds from various capital projects to fund such fiscal year 2022 LCIP projects as water main replacement rehab Riverfront Island implementation, public restrooms, pickleball courts, and street crosswalk report implementation plan projects. Requested action to approve the order authorizing transfer of surplus funds from various capital projects to fund such fiscal year 22 <clears throat> LCIP projects as water main replacement rehab, Riverfront Island implementation, public restrooms, 
pickleball courts and street crosswalk report implementation plan projects. So moved. moved for passage, Mr. Mayor. Second. That, was, that was moved by Councilor Ray, seconded by Councilor Gelinas. Uh, and I believe Heather has a brief presentation on this, Director. Um, certainly, Mr. Mayor. Um, this is a discussion or, or an order that we've done annually now for a couple of years using surplus bond proceeds to fund various LCIP requested projects in order to get those bond proceeds um, liquidated as soon as possible with regards to the IRS regulations. All of these projects were discussed as part of the both the LCIP workshops as well as the budget workshops. And when we solidified the allocation of fund balance and what was funded through bond issue um, at the last meeting in May, these projects were being brought before you to fund via uh, the surplus transfers. Okay, thank you. Questions or comments from the council? Seeing none to the public. All right, back to the council. Call the roll, please. Councilor from Ward 6? Yes. Ward 7? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. Ward 2? Yes. Ward 3? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. And Ward 5? Yes. Motion passed by vote of 7 to 0. All right, thank you. Agenda item number 8, please. Item number eight, resolve authorizing the transfer of surplus funds from various school capital projects to the Longley School upgrades and the Dingley Building roof projects. Requested action to approve the resolve authorizing the transfer of surplus funds from various school capital projects to the Longley School upgrades and the Dingley Building roof projects. So moved. Okay, moved by Councilor Ray, seconded by Councilor Clement. Uh, and I think I have. Uh, Man, that was not my second. Thank you. All right. Can, who gave that second? I did, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Council of Joy. Uh, and then I have listed our, our finance director and our superintendent. So I'm not sure who's presenting on this. Certainly, Please. Mr. Mayor. Um, I've worked with the school department. I'm not sure if the superintendent's here, but at this point, I can help you with that. Um, again, these have surplus bond proceeds. Um, this is an order that was approved by the school committee to reallocate these funds on some projects, some existing projects that um, need additional funding in order to complete them. All right, thank you. Questions or comments from the council? Okay, seeing none to the public. Back to the council. Call the roll, please. Councilor from Ward 6? Yes. Ward 7? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. Ward 2? Yes. Ward 3? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. And Ward 5? Yes. Motion passed by vote of 7 to 0. Okay, thank you. Agenda item number 9, please. Item number 9, confirmation of Mayor Kayer's nomination to fill the current vacancy in the Ward 2 position on the school committee. Requested action to receive the mayor's nomination and to appoint Janet Bowden to fill the vacant Ward 2 position on the Lewiston School Committee, said appointment to be effective as of June 15, 2021. All right, thank you. So move. So move, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Okay, I have a motion by Councilor Pettengill and a second uh, by Councilor Clements. Uh, so with that, uh, so I nominated uh, Janet Bowden. Uh, for, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, uh, longtime resident of the community, children's in the school. She's been an advocate for students and parents for several years now. Uh, with every appointment that I do, I typically, uh, the person that I'm uh, anticipating nominating, I call and ask uh, a lot of times some pretty tough questions about uh, their ability to work well with others, uh, to try to uh, their ability to try to find compromise, even when they have a strong passion. And I, I, uh, I probably, it's safe to say that Ms. Bowden has some strong passions within our community. Uh, I was really impressed not only with her application, but her responses on how she uh, anticipates uh, taking this role. 
Uh, and it was one that I'm confident that she will strive to work with com com committee members, regardless if she agrees with them or not. Uh, so I'm confident in this nomination that she'll bring value uh, to the committee. And with that, if the council is okay with it, I'd just like to give uh, Ms. Bowden just a moment to introduce herself and share what she would like to share with the council. Ms. Bowden. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can you hear me? I can, thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much for your kind words. Um, so I'm gonna kind of read part of the application that I sent you just for um, the public because speaking on the flies, not really my strong point. Um, so I am a parent of two students in Lewiston Public Schools. Um, my youngest is entering seventh grade at Lewiston Middle School this year. And my oldest is going to be a sophomore at Lewiston High School. Um, kind of a side note, I also have a sister-in-law with special needs that attends Lewiston Public Schools and I have two nieces in the school district. Um, for this reason, I have a vested interest in the quality of the educational experience here in Lewiston. Um, I'm a local preschool teacher and you can catch me picking lobsters and chucking clams in the summertime at Mr. C's. Um, being a private preschool teacher, I'm acquainted with many families who have children in this district, and I've developed relationships and a mutual respect with local elementary, middle school, and high school teachers. I've spent many years volunteering in my children's classrooms, and I've seen firsthand the early childhood education needs of our local student population. I've lived in this community for about 20 years now, um, I've served on committees, boards, the boosters, I've organized 5Ks, I've volunteered much of my free time, and um, I've come to appreciate that I have a very different perspective than most, but I'm also able to listen and learn and work towards common goals. Um, on this committee, I believe I will be fair-minded, collaborative, and a resource in informing the public about the work of the school committee. So I really do hope that you'll give me an opportunity to serve and make a positive impact on our school committee. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, questions or comments from the council? Councilor Ray. Mr. Mayor, I would like to make a motion to table this nomination to our next meeting. Okay. I would uh, I second that. Okay, that's moved and second to table. Any reason you'd like to share? If I might. Um, so last Tuesday, we turned down a proposal from the organization in town, Mears, because it was given to us nine hours before the meeting. Um, and I believe most counselors found that not acceptable. Um, this nomination was given to us just four hours before this meeting. I will refer back to past precedent uh, when we received nominations and approved nominations for or two, ironically, and previously we were given that nomination on Sunday before the meeting and Ward 7 filling that uh, position on the school committee. Similarly, we were given that same uh, two day lead time with a Sunday nomination for confirmation on Tuesday. Um, I, I just don't know that the public knows this is even happening. Um, there was a small snafu with the agenda. And so I would prefer to have more time to, to consider than less, but okay. obviously open for discussion. And I will take a vote tonight if asked to. All right, thank you. Uh, and then my only response to that would be that uh, we shared both with the public and with the city council, the reason that uh, of the time frame of this uh, application period. And I think we were quite clear that we'd, we would be presenting, getting the information to you on Monday or uh, getting the applications on Monday at 4 p.m. and then getting it directly to the council because of the uh, pending work of the committee. And I heard no objections from any of the councilors at that point. Uh, so that's my response to that. And I would encourage that, uh, that we not pass a tabling in, on this subject. Councilor Clement. Oh, wait, so I, think, so I think now we have to just, discussion needs to be around tabling only, correct? All right. So any other comments about tabling, Councilor Clement? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, it is your appointment, your appointment only. It is with our consent that you make that appointment. Uh, I would argue against tabling. I am personally acquainted with this uh, nomination and we'll speak on that in a moment after we defeat the tabling motion. Thank you. All right, thank you. Any other questions, uh, Councilor Pattengill? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I think it, it is imperative to 
do the nomination for the school committee tonight, um, given the work that they're up against with getting our, our students back into school, especially even more pressing now with the civil emergency ending. There's gonna be a lot of work on, on their hands to be able to get our students back to school and back to school safely. So I, I do think this is important to take care of tonight. Okay, thank you, Councilor Jensen. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, I guess, yeah, but I don't like items coming up kind of feeling like at the last minute, we do knew that this was um, the nomination we were gonna vote on tonight. Um, we haven't really had a consistent nomination process, which I know I brought up before and we didn't really have an interest in, in coming up with any kind of formal process here, but um, I think consistency is important. So um, I do wanna, you know, not have this table, you know, just for that reason. And so to be consistent, you know, for, for Ms. Bowden too, um, I, I'm perfectly fine with voting on this tonight and I don't see the need to table. Absolutely. All right. All right. Thank you. Councilor Clement, I see your hand raised again. Are you trying to comment on the same subject again? Yes, very quickly, Mr. Mayor. I believe this becomes even more important now as we're going to have another resignation, namely that of our council representative uh, to the school committee upcoming. So okay. I, I believe we need somebody to get in the seat and uh, let them get their feet wet so they can do the business before school starts in September. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So just point uh, a point of clarification, Madam Clerk, on tabling ish items. Do we go to public? Do we allow public comment as, in that regard? Um, there is debate is allowed amongst the body. I don't know that we've actually gone to the public in the past on procedural matters like this. It tends to be more um, substantive related matters on, on topics on the agenda. So I would say it's probably at your purview, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor. All right, thank you. So uh, any other questions or comments from the council? All right, and we will go to public comments when it comes to the vote on the matter, but at this, Councilor LaJoy. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I, I was kind of uh, concerned with the, uh, the short notice, but after your explanation just a few minutes ago uh, with regards as to uh, how the process would work from the last meeting. Uh, I'm comfortable with voting on it this evening. All thank right. you. All right, thank you. Any other uh, questions or comments from the council? Seeing none, call the roll, please. So just for clarification, this is to vote. Uh, the motion is to table this matter to the next meeting, which would be July 13th. Uh, Councilor from Ward 6? No. Ward 7? No. Ward 1? Yes. Ward two? No. Ward three? Yes. Ward four? No. And Ward five? No. Motion failed by a vote of two to five. So now the original motion is before you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. Questions or comments from the council? Councilor Clement. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I will just say that I am personally acquainted with your nominee and it will be my distinct pleasure and honor to vote in her favor uh, for an addition to the school committee for the city of Lewis. And I think she'll make an excellent addition. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Councilor Jensen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, just wanted to support the nomination and the name you're putting forward. Uh, Ms. Bowden has done a lot of good for the community. And so I think she's a, a good fit for the school committee. So just wanna support the nomination and say that I will be voting in favor. All right, thank you. Any other questions or comments from the council? Councilor Pettengill. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I too, uh, you know, want to throw my support uh, behind Ms. Bowden. Um, her and I have, have met and spoke many a times. Um, and if uh, I, I can't say more for her ability to work with people um, that have differing viewpoints as her and I have um, had many, many differing viewpoints on many things. Um, and she's always approached it in, in the best interest. Um, and trying to do the, the right thing. So I, I think she's gonna get a lot of good work done on the school committee. So I, I applaud her for that open-mindedness and her ability to, to do the work. All right, thank you. Any other questions or comments from the council? Seeing none to the uh, public, uh, just a, so I have two folks from the public with hands raised. I just, uh, word of caution, please direct your questions or comments to the mayor. Uh, we'll start with Mr. Hamad. Hamad. Good evening, sir. Uh, I'm a lady, but hi. Oh, um, I'm sorry. It's okay. 
Uh, I disagree with the nomination. I don't think that she would be a good fit to the um, school committee because she's a Republican activist. And also uh, we need more people of color to represent the city of Lewiston. And she doesn't fit that uh, category. So that's just all I have to say. All right, thank you very much. Uh, and then next, I believe, Ali. Nope. All right, well, and I think you can keep Mr. Nicholson there because I think he had his hands raised. Uh, so we'll, we'll go there. Mr. Nicholson? Hi, can you hear me? I can. Great. Hi, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, I just want to um, add another dissenting voice for the nomination. Um, I was troubled by Ms. Bowden's petition uh, demanding that another member of the school board resign this fall um, over what to me felt more like a, a, you know, a difference of opinion rather than any sort of rules being broken, which to me maybe speaks to a uh, potentially combative uh, spirit being added to the school board, which I know you spoke to at the beginning, um, but I'd just like to say that I was, I was troubled by it and uh, I would not support her nomination. All right, thank you, Mr. Nicholson. And, uh, and then Ash Asho Ali. Good evening. Good evening. I would just like to say uh, what Najma said. Um, I don't think that he should be hired or he should be a candidate because we need more black people to say something. And I just feel like that um, a lot of the schools, there's people that go through a lot, especially the black community. So all I have to say is um, that she doesn't get what black struggles go through, what black people go through. So right. yeah. Thank you very um, much. Yeah, no problem. All right, and I didn't mean to cut you off. Okay. Uh, all right, Mr. Bannister. Good evening. Can you hear me? I, we can, go ahead, sir. Mr. Mayor, thank you. Um, yeah, no, I, I wanted to say, I wanna commend you, Mr. Mayor, on your second consecutive stellar nomination for a vacant seat on our school committee in the city of Lewiston. Uh, whether you, you know, agree or disagree with it, I think it's a, it's a difficult decision to make um, with the previous uh, school committee member resigning, unfortunately, to become further involved in the Lewiston community and, and uh, interact with, with kids. I think mean, it's a, you know, a testament to him. And uh, I think we want to give the opportunity to Ms. Bowden. She's an outstanding community activist, uh, very involved in the, in the school committee. And, and uh, I think, you know, you, you want to be able to provide an opportunity for people to grow and learn and, and uh, learn from their values and views uh, versus, you know, making accusations when you, you only know very little about the person. So anyway, um, congratulations to you. Congratulations to Ms. Bowden. I hope her uh, nomination is successful. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right, uh, back to the council. Questions or comments from the council, Councilor Ray. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for the opportunity to speak. I additionally have concerns about this nomination and uh, will be voting in opposition to it. Um, given that I also serve on the school committee, I do want to invite open conversation and open-mindedness as we move forward. But um, in the four hours since since I heard the news, um, it's hard to kind of prove that. And so um, I, I'm, I'm hopeful uh, if the nomination does pass that that is true and real and happens, but um, I currently cannot support it with the time given. Okay, thank you. Councilor Jensen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, wholly inappropriate to, to bring up any potential rumor, put, the, put some on the spot like this when all of us don't have the information here. So I do wanna make that clear. And as someone who's been on the other end where Ms. Bowden is sitting, as someone who's nominated for a council seat, it's not a fun position to be in. And um, I know like for me, counselors delayed my nomination twice and it was pretty miserable, I'm not gonna lie. Um, so I, I don't think it's fair to really put nominees in this position. Um, so 
just I'm, I'm kind of I'm kind of appalled right now, to be perfectly honest. So, um, to come to your defense, Ms. Bowden, um, you're an excellent person in the community. You've done a lot of good for the community. Doesn't matter what anyone's political party is. As a teacher myself, you think of who do you want to join a school committee? You want that involved PTO parent to join. They're the ones who know what's going on. They, they tend to know what's going on in the classroom more than uh, the school board members do. So um, that those are the kind of people you want to get involved. And so um, the mayor made his decision based on the people who applied for the position. And he made the choice based on people who applied. And so um, it wasn't really made with any demographic decision first and foremost, I'm sure. Um, so when you look at this on the nomination, there may be some political disagreements with Ms. Bowden, um, but that's no reason to deny the nomination. So um, I just want to affirm that I will definitely be supporting this nomination. It's not fair to levy any kind of accusation against a candidate you know, who's, who's been nominated like this. You think about public hearings at like even the congressional level, it's not members of the audience kind of coming up and commenting and making any accusation they want. It's the elected officials in, in charge um, asking the questions in a very organized way that doesn't end up hurting the reputation of the nominee. And so I think we do need to do better by protecting our nominees and members of the community. Um, so I'm not really sure to end this, but those are my thoughts right now. I'm definitely voting in favor, so. Okay, thank you, Councilor Khalid. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I will be voting no on this nominee because of what um, Councilor Ray has said mostly, but for me, it's regarding the timeline and the short time that we were given. Um, you did explain the reasoning, but still, um, I do have some hesitations and therefore I will not be supporting um, this. Thank you. All right, thank you. Councilor Clement. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would just remind all in attendance this evening that both bodies, the school committee and the city council are nonpartisan by charter. Uh, to have somebody bring up uh, a bit of a character assassination by labeling somebody as a political activist, I would remind people that we have uh, members of both parties sitting on the council, some very active members of both parties. And I don't think that has affected anybody, nor do I think anybody has bothered to label any of them as activists or uh, divisive in nature or anything. And I find that highly offensive towards any nominee. I will vote in favor of this nomination tonight. I think it's an excellent nomination. I commend you. I think you've made a couple of excellent choices for our school committee. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to uh, strongly encourage that we not go back and forth here. Everyone has had their, their moment for an opinion. Uh, so, all right, thank you. Uh, all right, so are there any other questions or comments from councils? Council? Seeing none, call the roll, please. Councilor from Ward 6. My honor and distinct pleasure to vote yes. I apologize, our lights are on a timer. Uh, Councilor from Ward 6, I believe you voted yes, sir? Yes, my honor and distinct pleasure to vote yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Councilor from Ward 7? Yes. Ward one? No. Ward two? Yes. Ward three? No. Ward four? Yes. And Ward five? Yes. Motion passed by vote of five to two. All right, thank you. Congratulations, uh, Ms. Bowden, and good luck. Thank you. Okay, agenda item number 10, please. Item number 10, order authorizing the city administrator to execute an extension of the single stream recyclables agreement with Casella Recycling LLC for a second five-year period for July 1st, 2021 to June 30th, 2026. Requested action to approve the order authorizing the city administrator to execute an extension of the single stream recyclables agreement with Casella Recycling LLC for a second five-year period from July 1, 2021 to June 30th, 2026. All right, way too many at the same time. So I'll go with a uh, motion by Council Joy. And I'm not, I think the seconds were totally wiped out. So I'm gonna give that to Councilor you. Ray has the, you, you did a motion initially. So Council of Joy and seconded by Councilor Ray. Uh, Director Brechnik, if we could have a very brief presentation, but an adequate one. I'm not trying to cut you off. <laughs> that can be brief. Good evening, Mayor and uh, members of the council. This is a standard extension. It's the last one as the original contract stands. 
so that we added another clause in there to continue this for the lease of the building. So we have two contracts with Casella. The separate one is for the building that is right beside the solid waste facility. And that was a 20 year agreement. So we've included in this another extension that lasts the same number of years as that lease. I think that's in the best interest of our you know, city. We're most likely to continue working with Casella. Um, and you know, the, I think that was just another extension to put in there. So just why it's such a long time is that we're already in that partnership with them already. So if there's any questions about recycling or anything like that, I'd be happy to answer. But that's the gist of this um, the request tonight. All right, thank you very much. Any questions or comments from the council? Okay, seeing none to the public. Back to the council. All right, call the roll, please. Councilor from Ward 6? Yes. Ward 7? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. Ward 2? Yes. Ward 3? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. And Ward 5? Yes. Motion passed by vote of 7 to 0. Okay, thank you, Director Prenzik. Have a nice evening. Okay, agenda item number 11, please. Item number 11, order authorizing the city administrator to take the necessary steps to sell the city owned properties at 12 Ann Street and 14 Ann Street. Requested action to approve the order authorizing the city administrator to take the necessary steps to sell the city owned properties at 12 Ann Street and 14 Ann Street. Okay, thank you. I have a director of finance listed as the presenter. Certainly, Mr. Mayor. Um, this is, um, as we've done in, with other tax acquired properties, we've put this out to bid. We've sought planning board approval on it, and it is brought before the city council to take action. Okay, thank you. Questions or comments from the council? Councilor Ray? Forgive me if I'm misreading, but it looked like the recommendation from uh, Alan Ward, the purchasing agent, was not accepted it looks like he had recommended the organization the development llc when it looks like it's going to the individual i think he put the individual's name versus that the person LLC. owns that company yes okay that was very confusing in the way it's spaced out Yes, I, I will verify with him in the morning, but I think that is my understanding. Okay, thank you very much for that clarification. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments from the council? Mr. Mayor, is there a motion on the table? Oh, Madam Clerk saying no, so thank you. We'll do that before I go on. on Don't move, end. Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. Motion by Councilor Clement. Second. Seconded by Councilor Jensen. Okay. Uh, so any, uh, any questions or comments from the council at this point? Councilor Ray? Sorry, there's also a note about 12 Johnson Street on part of the paperwork. Is that inclusive of this bid or is that just something we'll deal with separately? That will require a separate, act, a separate action. Okay, and that is not an action we are taking tonight. That's correct. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments from the council? Seeing none to the public. Back to the council. Call the roll, please. Council from Ward 6? Yes. Ward 7? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. Ward 2? Yes. Ward 3? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. And Ward 5? Yes. Motion passed by vote of 7 to 0. Okay, thank you. Gender item 12, reports and updates. Councilor Ray? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The school committee met last Monday. Um, the dates are hard right now. Um, we are working on a plan to update our truancy policy to come in line with the state rules for that. Um, we are trying to give some latitude to our truancy officers um, in terms of notification of law enforcement, but we need to check if that's okay with being in line with state law. So just a heads up on that. Additionally, we're starting to talk about policy on student dress code. Our current dress code policy is incredibly narrow um, according to an analysis by the Maine School Board Management Association. And so uh, we're looking at something that's slightly more expansive. Um, this came up as a result of a conversation with little, 
Lewiston Middle School students about wearing hats and hoods. It's expanded far beyond that um, into a conversation about what is appropriate dress at school and who is responsible for that. So more to come on that, but um, just in case you saw some of the nice news stories about middle school students getting involved in policy. Great, thank you. Any other reports or updates? Okay, seeing none, uh, agenda item 13. Any other business counselors or others may have relating to Lewiston city government? Councilor Ray. So I know a couple of you have been copied into some emails recently, but, um, and Dottie helped us out and posted about the city fireworks policy um, and clarification around uh, when folks can use fireworks and in what areas of the city. Just wanted to publicly state about that, the information uh, Dottie provided what was on social media, also an email blast. Um, so I'm super grateful to her for doing that, but also wanted to draw the public's attention to it. Okay, thank you. Any other uh, city business from councilors, other city business from councilors? Okay, seeing none, I'll entertain a motion to enter into executive session to discuss a legal matter uh, regarding contract negotiations. So moved. Second the motion. Okay, moved by Councillor Khalid, seconded by Councillor Clement. Uh, call the roll, please. Councillor from Ward 6? Yes. Ward 7? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. Ward 2? Yes. Ward 3? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. And Ward 5? Yes. Motion passed by vote of 7 to 0. Question of procedure, Mr. Mayor. Go ahead. Um, it looks like we have three items on our executive session, only one of which may result in uh, further action. Can we not announce all three of these? Do we have to come back after each and every one? How does that work? So typically what we do is uh, once, once we, uh, yeah, so we will have public care waiting. Are we, are we gonna have to go in and out of each session? Okay, I just knew that for the benefit of the public so they'll know whether we're gonna be coming back or just what's gonna be happening, that's all. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, so counselors, five minutes before we go into executive session, does anybody need time? Okay, so five to eight minutes max, thank you.
Okay, uh, thank you everybody. And for public notification, there is no action uh, following our most recent executive session. With that said, I'll entertain a motion to enter into executive session to discuss a labor union negotiations item. So, so moved. moved. Okay, moved by Councilor Clement and Councilor Gelinas. Was that you that chimed in at the same time? No? Councilor Ray, seconded by Councilor Ray. Thank you. Uh, Call the roll, please. Sure. Councilor from Ward 6? Yes. Ward 7? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. Ward 2? Yes. Ward 3? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. And Ward 5? Yes. Motion passed by vote of 7 to 0. Okay, thank you.
All right. I'm not sure what council has said, but it does get kind of dizzy and going back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, for public notice, there will be no action on uh, the executive session that we're leave, or returning back to this meeting from. So with that said, I'll entertain uh, a motion to enter into executive session pursuant to MRSA Title I, Section 4056A to discuss a personal, personnel matter regarding the city administrative search process with possible city council action to follow. So no moved, move, Mr. Mayor. All right, uh, moved by Councilor Khalid, and I need a second. Second. Seconded by Councilor July. Ms. Call the roll, please. Councilor from Ward 6? Yes. Ward 7? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. Ward 2? Yes. Ward 3? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. And Ward 5? Yes. Motion passed by vote of 7 to 0. Okay, thank you.
soon as uh, Council Joy gets in here, we'll get going. Okay, I'll uh, entertain a motion. Mr. Mayor. Council Clement. I move that the council pass city council order dated June 15th, 2021. Do I have a second? So moved, second. Okay, moved by Councilor Clement, seconded by Councilor Pattengill, Council President LaJoy, if you could read that order into record. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, City of Lewiston, um, City Council order June 15th, 2021. Order, appointing Heather Hunter as the interim city administrator. Whereas resignations have been tendered by both the city administrator and deputy city administrator. And whereas in addition to prescribed language in the city charter, the city council supports Heather Hunter fulfilling this role. And whereas not to lose momentum, the city council directs the interim city administrator to make changes as needed, execute strategic initiatives, make other interim appointments and suggest recommendations to the current organizational structure. And whereas assign all authority and power to the city administrator that is required by the charter ordinances and other governing documentations to Heather Hunter. Now, therefore, be it ordered by the city council of the city of Lewiston to appoint Heather Hunter as the interim city administrator with an interim salary adjustment of 5%, a 5% 457 deferred compensation employer match and reimburse actual mileage and travel expenses effective Wednesday, July 28th, 2021. Okay, thank you. Questions or comments from the council? Seeing none to the public. Back to the council. Call the roll. Council from Ward 6? Yes. Ward 7? Yes. Ward one? Yes. Ward two? Yes. Ward three? Yes. Ward four? Yes. And ward five? Yes. Motion passed by vote of seven to zero. Okay, thank you. And Mar Madam Clerk, uh, Director Hunter will get a copy of that to you first thing in the morning. Thank you. With that, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. Okay, moved by Council of Clement, seconded by Council of Gelinas. All in favor, or call the roll. Council Ward 6? Yes. Ward 7? Yes. Ward 1? Yes. Ward 2? Yes. Ward 3? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. And Ward 5? Yes. Motion passed by vote of 7 to 0. Okay, thank you all. Good night. Good night, all.